Well, friends, it is the Sunday after Easter, which means you get to hear yet another sermon on the story of Thomas the Apostle. The Revised Common Lectionary, which is a three-year schedule of texts that uh, prescribes what we read each Sunday, directs us to read the story of Thomas not once every three years, but every single year on the Sunday after Easter. So there is a pretty good chance that you have heard this story before. And I'm trying like really hard not to call him Doubting Thomas because I really think that Thomas gets a bad rap. If you look back at the story, poor Thomas doesn't really ask for anything that the other disciples hadn't received already. I mean, at the beginning of this morning's passage, they are all doubting what Mary Magdalene has come and told them, that, that Jesus was risen. They are all huddled together in fear behind locked doors. Um, and here, unfortunately, we have to pause because it is just tragic that the text says they were uh, in fear of the Jews. Um, and the fact that texts and like this, uh, texts like this have been used to justify persecution of Jews and Muslims is just wrong. Um, it makes Jesus weep, um, and so I felt the need to just say that. Um, we have to name that uh, before we go forward. Um, but at any rate, verse 20 very strongly suggests that, that even when Jesus was standing right in front of them, the other disciples didn't believe that it was him until they themselves saw the wounds in his hands and, and in his side. And, and that is actually what interests me most this morning, more than Thomas's doubt or, or lack of doubt, but the way that Jesus dispels the doubt. Thomas said, until I've touched the scars left by the nails in his hands, and thrust my hand into the wound in his side, I will not believe. If Jesus is really risen from the dead, I want to see the scars, Thomas said. That's how I'll know that it's really him. And, you know, it makes sense. It's the same way that nervous family members would identify a, the, a missing loved one is by their scars or by their unique birthmarks. But as far as John's purpose and in including this detail in his gospel, this isn't really seeking to uh, prove to the disciples that this man who suddenly appeared before them really was Jesus and not some other 33-year-old Galilean look-alike. No, John's purpose in describing the scars is to prove to us, to prove to the reader that Jesus, the resurrected one who appeared to the disciples in flesh and blood, really did die. Even on Easter, reminders of Good Friday remain. The scars remind us that the risen one is the one who was crucified. Cynics, like preacher's kids like me, like to ask why. Why did Jesus have to die? And I do think that it's a good question. The standard pitch given by most mainstream Christians is that if we believe in Jesus, when we die, that won't be the end. 
If we believe in Jesus, when we die, we will reap the reward of eternal life in heaven with God and with everyone else who believes in Jesus. And so the reason Jesus had to die was to prevent us from having to go to the other place, the bad place. But let's push on that a little harder. How exactly does Jesus having to die fit into that? Assuming God only wants people who believe in Jesus in heaven, which itself I think is a big assumption, the question remains. Why couldn't God just have decided that the people who believe in Jesus are going to get to go to heaven and skip the whole Jesus having to suffer and die part? If Jesus had just ascended into heaven at the end of his ministry, we would still have to have faith without proof. We would still need to be counted among those who have not yet seen but still believe, to quote verse 29 from today's reading. So I'm here to tell you today that the good news is so much better than that. So much better than the if you believe you get to heaven, Jesus had to die so you didn't have to go to hell story that most of us have been told. The last verse in this morning's reading says, these things are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Life. Not eternal life. Not life after you die. Not life in heaven. Just life. According to John 10.10, 10, which we're going to read next week, by the way, it's abundant life, if you need a qualifying adjective, here and now life. You see, throughout his ministry, Jesus did not think that it was good enough to wait until someone had died to alleviate their suffering or bring them joy. He didn't just go around talking about himself and, and performing miracles so that people would believe in him and go to heaven after they died. No, he did it to bring joy and peace and wholeness and relief from pain and scarcity on earth. So at the wedding at Cana, even though his time had not yet come, they had run out of wine. So Jesus made their cups overflow with the best wine they had ever tasted. And at the Sea of Galilee, when there is a crowd of hungry people, Jesus doesn't just tell them about spiritual food in heaven. No, he literally feeds them with more bread than they'd ever seen in one place, more, more bread than they could imagine, so that on that night, no one would go to bed hungry. And, and when Lazarus died, and, and Jesus witnessed the pain that it caused his loved ones, and when he feels the sorrow from that loss, the faithful response that, that Martha gives, that, that she knows that she will see Lazarus again at the resurrection on the last day, that's not good enough. Jesus weeps with them and brings Lazarus back to life, even if it's just for a little while, even if it's just so they can say one last goodbye. And in the same way, when 
there is injustice, when there is pain, when there is suffering and grief in our lives, the response of just accept that everything happens for a reason is not good enough. You just have to remember that this is God's will. It's not good enough. If you can keep the faith until you die, God will make it all better in heaven. That answer is not good enough. Jesus wants real healing now, wants restoration of relationships now. That is the Easter message. Jesus' own suffering and death is a reminder that when you suffer, you don't do it alone. Jesus suffered too. The answer to why did Jesus have to suffer, why did Jesus have to die, is that he didn't have to. He chose to. A choice that was awful and beautiful and courageous and tragic. He chose to because even after Easter, it is clear to anyone with eyes that we still live in a Good Friday world. The truth of Christ's resurrection has not yet fully conquered the truth of our lived experience. We still suffer. We still see Jesus suffering. The fear, death, and, and isolation wrought by the coronavirus has gripped the entire world in recent weeks seemingly sucking out all of the oxygen in the room. But problems that existed before the world went on lockdown did not just go away when that happened. There's still violence, still war, still cancer, poverty, abuse. Jesus chose to die because if there is to be suffering and hurt in this world, the will of God is that no one go through it alone. It was important for Jesus to show his scars not only to Thomas but to the rest of the disciples because in sharing our wounds with one another, we are able to access it's no accident that, that what he did right after showing them his scars was to breathe God's Spirit onto the disciples. Because God's Spirit is made present to us through the gift of, of someone who simply allows us to feel what we Feel, and, and who invites us to enter into the pain that, that they feel, rather than trying to explain our wounds away or cover their own scars up and insist for the sake of sound theology that we do the same. The spiritual author Anne Lamott, in her book, Traveling Mercies, tells the story of her friends Sarah and Adam, whose daughter was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. She describes how their community of friends could have easily decided that Sarah and Adam needed privacy during that time, and could have allowed their own discomfort paralyze them from doing anything. But instead, 
those friends made the bold, compassionate decision to suffer with them. Lamont writes, I had a vision of this disaster as a giant canvas on which had been painted a beautiful picture, and we all wanted to take up a corner or stand side by side and lift it together so that Sarah and Adam didn't have to carry the whole thing themselves. So we did. Sometimes we cleaned for them. We listened. We showed up. We cried. We took their other kids to the park. We let Sarah and Adam hate what was going on when they needed to. Sometimes we let them resist finding any meaning or solace at all with anything that had to do with their daughter's diagnosis. And this was one of the hardest things to do, to try to stop making things come out better than what they were. We let them spew when they needed to, and we offered the gift of no comfort, where there being no comfort was where Sarah and Adam had landed. In other words, Sarah and Adam's friends let them show their scars. They touched those scars. They were not afraid of their wounded places. They knew that those wounds could be a source of healing if they just let them. Lamont doesn't go on to tell the end of the story, only that there was comfort in knowing that in the messiness of life, we are not alone. And sometimes it is when people are able to experience that presence that they can turn the page and make it to a place of hope. Charles Spurgeon is a theologian who I probably would only normally quote in order to argue with him, but he preached a sermon once about why the risen Christ had wounds. He said, the risen Christ has wounds because those wounds are the only trophy that a warrior without a weapon has. On the cross, Jesus went to battle against death, and death sucked the lifeblood out of Jesus. But, unbeknownst to death, the source of life that death sucked out from Christ was the source of life itself. And so, when death sucked that life out, death died. That is why Jesus had to die, because for us, death still is. If, if Jesus had not had, had died for as long as death still exists in the world, we would have no hope. But because Jesus died and rose again, death and pain and suffering can now be for us sources of healing and life. Because Jesus chose to suffer and die, the pain we do not choose for ourselves has the potential to be redeemed. Jesus died for us so that we might have the courage to touch the wounds of others, not to fix them or to heal them, but simply to let them know that we are present, that 
God is present. And because of that, death will die. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed.